how to calculate expected return standard deviation uh, using historical return data. So let's look at this example, numerical example in this slide. So suppose you are looking at um, two stocks, stock C and stock T. And we don't have historical return um, for these two stocks. So in the previous chapter, uh, when you were analyzing these risky assets, like months one, months two, that, that kind of uh, historical return data was available. But in the real world, uh, we, we may need to evaluate risky assets that has not been traded in the market. For example, initial public offering, before initial public offering, for, for example, that kind of new stocks that have never been traded in the market, we may not have historical return data. Or when a company goes through a significant change, then historical return information might not be uh, very useful. So evaluating what's going to happen in the future. So remember expected return and risk is about what's going to happen in the future. We are analyzing risky investments. So in those kind of cases, you should know how to evaluate the riskiness of um, a security using other methods than historical return data. So this kind of methodology you are learning now is useful in that kind of situation. So if there is no historical return data, what can we do? We still have analysts analyzing, a lot of analysts and economists analyzing the stock market and uh, those professional analysts and hedge fund managers, those people are familiar with uh, companies and those analysts to provide some kind of analysis scenarios. So suppose you are working for an investment bank and working closely with those analysts and they provide this kind of data. So for company C, if we have recession ne next year, the return will be low at 2%. But if the economy is in a normal situation, the return will be a lot higher at 10%. But we will have an economic boom uh, because of the vaccine become successful and economy recovers quickly and a stock market is booming even more. And then stock C return will be 15%. And take a look and companies at T Similarly, uh, an analyst provides a, a, a scenario for company T, 25% return for economic boom, 20% return for a normal economy, and during recession, 1% will be the return. So those are the uh, probability scenarios, economic boom and normal recession. So there may be more other scenarios uh, in the real world, So in that case, so, but this is a uh, classroom example. So to make our calculations manageable, I'm just presenting three scenarios. So based on these three scenarios, so you, you take a look at this data, stock C versus stock T. So which stock um, looks more risky? By risky, I mean returns are, become, are more volatile, more uncertain. So definitely uh, stock T has a lot more uncertain returns. It can be very high at 25% and very uh, low at 1%. So compared to stock C, stock T look, return 
look more uncertain. By that I mean it looks start return has a, a lot more variability. But if I ask you, how can we quantify how much more risk here uh, stock T is, then what you learn in this chapter help you answer that question, quantify risk. And in this chapter, you are learning two risk measures. First, here you are learning how to use standard deviation to evaluate total return. And later in this chapter, you're going to learn uh, how to measure systematic risk using data. So first, in, in this example, let's focus on uh, how calculating standard deviation. So to calculate standard deviation, you need to calculate the expected return first and then calculate variance and then standard deviation. So how to calculate the expected return? First, you need to uh, multiply the probability of each state by the return in each state. So 30% probability multiplied by 15% return for the economic boom and 50% probability multiplied by 10% uh, return in that state and do the same for recession. And by the way, the recession probability is 20%. It's not given but you should be able to tell the recession probability is 20%. Why? Because probabilities should add up to 100% by definition. So this way you calculate the return on stock C, expected return on stock C, because it's an expected return. Because it's about the future. It's uncertain. It's not a realized return. It's an expected return. What's going to happen next year? So in the future, so you just you do the same calculation for uh, stock C. So you calculate the expected return on stock C is 17.7%. And if I ask you to calculate, if I ask you to tell me what's the risk premium, so which stock has a higher risk premium? If the risk free rate is 3%, by definition, risk of premium is expected return on a risky asset minus the risk free asset. If you learned in, in the previous chapter. So, uh, expected return, uh, risk premium for stock T is 14.7%. Uh, and risk premium for stock C is 6.9%. So that means stock T has a higher risk premium. Why? Because stock T is riskier. Returns are more variable. Mm -hmm. So let's measure the volatility, variability using variance and standard deviation. So the variance of a risky asset, when we are given probability by definition, return in each minus expected return we just calculated square we are scaring the deviation from the mean because if we don't scare and just add positive deviation and negative deviation cancels out so we not we are not going to get the measure of variability so that's why we uh, first to find the deviation from the expected return and square to make to prevent those deviations canceling out. So we want to measure the variability. So that's why we square them not to cancel out. So we first square deviation from the expected return and then we need to give proper per weight because economic boom, normal economy, and recession have different probabilities estimated by economists and analysts in the firm working with those who use this data. So those who use this probability data get help from analysts and economists and receive data from them and analyze the riskiness of this stock. So 
we have probability of each state, so deviation from the mean square should be weighted properly and then add all those for each state and that's variance. I see a movement in the chat box. Okay, refresh the screen and take measures to get a better quality audio, okay. All right, so that's what we have. Uh, that's how to calculate variance using standard, uh, using probability data. And this is a calculation, showing calculation. So we first use the expected return 9.9% for stock C and 17.7% for stock T. And for economic boom, normal economy, and recession for each of those three states, calculate deviation from the mean, square, and then multiply by each state's probability to give the weight and add them all to find the variance. So the variance of this is the variance of stock T, a stock C, and this is the variance of stock t and the square root of variance is standard deviation so standard deviation of stock c is 4.5 percent and similarly stock t's standard deviation is 8.63 percent and this clearly shows so definitely 8.63 percent standard deviation is higher then 4.5% standard deviation. So this quantifies how much more riskier stock T is compared to stock C. So this is how to measure the total risk over risky investment, stocks, bonds, any risky assets. Uh, if we, are, uh, we know the probability of each state and what is the return, what will be the return in each state, and then we can calculate expected return, variance, and standard deviation. So any questions so far? So if you have any questions, let me stop share for a while. And if you have any questions, you can write your question on the chat box or unmute and speak. So I don't see or hear any questions, so let's continue. All right, then now we move on to portfolios. So this concept can be applied not only to individual security, but or also a portfolio of risky assets. So a portfolio means a collection of assets so stock portfolio bond portfolio hybrid portfolio any risky assets combination that's a portfolio so but to make things simple let's take a look at a portfolio so for example two stocks you buy target stock and uh signa stock and that's a portfolio of two stocks for example so asset risk and return are important in how those as each individual asset risk can uh, affect the risk and return of the portfolio. But the important is when we mix two stocks, the portfolio might not just a simple combination because their interaction is important so it's very important to know how to analyze portfolios so that's why uh, we focus on measuring the risk and return of a portfolio so the risk return trade-off for a portfolio is measured similarly the risk return trade-off of a portfolio is measured by portfolio expected return and portfolio standard deviation so the next several slides show how to calculate portfolio expected return and standard deviation. So 
we are looking at in this slide you are looking at a four a portfolio with two stocks so dclk coca-cola intel kei stocks so there was four stocks and suppose you invested fifteen thousand dollar invested in those four stocks and what are the portfolio weights what are the weights of those stocks in your four stock portfolio so remember portfolio weights are based on the dollar amounts you invested in each stock so for example how do you calculate the weight of coca-cola stock ticker symbol ko in your portfolio you invested three thousand out of fifteen thousand in coca-cola so twenty percent is the weight of coca-cola stock in your portfolio and similarly you can calculate the weight of other stocks and remember portfolio weight should add up to 100 percent so after you do the calculation if you find the weight find the weights that do not add up to 100%, you should immediately notice that something went wrong. So portfolio weights calculation. It's simple, but you need to remember uh, clearly. Otherwise, you, you may have difficulty during a quiz or exam, so you need to uh, practice. So that's why you need to use the connect problems to practice also that's why i give you in class quizzes so by the way the next quiz will be on wednesday and the coverage is chapter 12 and chapter 13 and whatever we finish today so chapter 12 and chapter 13 13 uh, covered today those are the coverage of the quiz uh, that we will you will take on wednesday this coming wednesday and uh wednesday the homework problem set for chapter 13 is due and also the following week chapter 14 uh homework assignment is due next week and also uh next week you have the bmc project due and the final exam is on <clears throat> December 16. And remember, final exam will start at 10.30. It's uh, from 10.30 to 12.30. So it's not 11. It starts at 10.30. I follow all the schedule, uh, the college is the final exam schedule, as well as everything is written on the syllabus. It's a uh, final exam schedule and also uh, the project due day so check the connect website and and you should submit your project to blackboard there is a dropbox and there is a late penalty for uh, connect homeworks as well as the project due deadline so don't miss the deadline so you should avoid uh, getting the late submission penalty so uh, meet the deadline so portfolio expected return how to calculate portfolio expected return just simple so portfolio average expected return is just a weighted average expected return of um, assets in the portfolio so this rule so in the future you're gonna learn a lot about portfolios especially those who will take next level finance courses so clearly remember this returns always add linearly meaning that portfolio return is always weighted average return of individual uh, securities in the portfolio but risk is a different story Variance and standard, this kind of weighted or average approach does not apply to risk because of diversification. So you should not uh, calculate uh, 
portfolio risk using weighted average approach, that's wrong. But the return is different. When you calculate portfolio return, it's always weighted average of individual securities in the portfolio. So remember, returns always add linearly, but risk does not. And portfolio return and portfolio expected returns are always weighted average of individual return and individual re expected return. Definitely weight are probabilities. Yeah. So any questions so far? And then let's use the, uh, go back to this numerical example. So this uh, example shows what are the expected returns of each of those four stocks. And these expected return, for example, Coca-Cola's expected return is 8.96%, and other stocks' expected returns are also given. And we just calculate the wage. So this 8.96%, Coca-Cola's expected return, how much weight it should be given to calculate your portfolio's expected return? The weight should be 20%. Why? because you invested 20% of your money in Coca-Cola. So that's why 20% of weight is given to Coca-Cola's expected return. And similar methodology applied to other, the other three stocks and you get your portfolio expected return is 10.24%. Oh, you may wonder, oh, this DCLK stock has a lot higher expected return, 19.65%, but why? My portfolio's expected return is much lower, only 10.24%. This stock has a lot higher expected return because you invested only 13.3% in this risky stock has, that has higher expected return. So remember the risk return trade-off, higher expected return, Investors require higher uh, risk, uh, risk premium for risky assets, so riskier stocks have a higher expected return. So there is a risk return trade-off. If you like more risk premium, you need to take more risk. If you hate risk, then you need to have a reasonable expectation. So I see a movement in the chat box, so let's take a look what's there. Yes, yes, say the yes. You can stay, uh, yeah, I will, I, I can stay after class. So if you need to talk, yeah, we can talk after class. Yeah, no problem. All right. Uh, okay, so this is how to calculate portfolio expected return. And next, so we need to analyze the risk return trade-off for using portfolios. So you need to be able to calculate portfolio variance and portfolio standard deviation. But as I mentioned before, we can easily calculate portfolio expected return using weighted average expected return. But that logic does not apply to variance and standard deviation. So how to calculate variance portfolio variance and standard deviation using individual stocks variance and standard deviation that's actually beyond this introductory finance class. So that's actually will be the topic of finance 3330 investment class. But Still, in this class, I, you need to know how to calculate portfolio variance and standard deviation. So we, you learn a different method that's less complicated, a different method, a different alternative. So that's what we'll, I will tell you. So first, how do you calculate portfolio variance and portfolio standard deviation? It's not a weighted average. Then there is a trick. So this, these slides show you a short, uh, a different way to overcome that kind of issue. So the, the key is you first calculate portfolio return. Calculate the portfolio return first because returns are always weighted average. Portfolio returns 
are always weighted average returns of each security in the portfolio. So that's the key. So first, you calculate portfolio return for each state using the weighted average approach. So weight of all the stocks, all the securities, and returns of all the securities. So you calculate the re portfolio return for each state first, and then regard that portfolio return, use that portfolio return and apply that uh, individual security equation to calculate variance and standard deviation. So that's the key. So let's use a numerical example. So suppose you have, you have two stocks in a portfolio, stock A and stock B. And here is a scenario. So in this case, we only have two scenarios, economic boom and bust. So probability of each, economic boom probability 40%, and economic bust probability 60%. Oh, it looks like uh, this, this analyst is giving more dial outlook. So it's, it's the, the bust probability is higher, 60%. That happens, yeah. We have good years, bad years. So it looks like in this scenario, economic bust uh, is more likely, according to this analyst. And then stock A, in each of those two stages, stock A and stock B, uh, stock A is expected to earn 30% if uh, economy is in boom, but economy uh, struggles next year, uh, stock A will lose 10%. And stock B, looks weird oh this stock will do a lot better during economic bust it may be related to disaster relief or some other scenarios some some other business so that that's possible some stocks may do better during economic bust it's it's hard to find but but there are some short selling related strategies or put options related strategies, commodities related strategy, that's possible. So stock B, this security B will have 25% return if there is economic bust in that kind of scenario, maybe vaccine related or uh, like pandemic related uh, stocks, I don't know, but that's possible, that kind of security is possible. And it, but if there is an economic boom, the stock, stock B will have 5% um, loss. So if that's the case, and suppose if you invest 50% of your money in stock A, and if the, the other 50% in stock B, how can you calculate the expected return and standard deviation of your portfolio. And remember, oh, to calculate portfolio expected return and portfolio standard deviation, you first calculate the portfolio return in each state. How? Portfolio return in each state is, for economic boom, what will be your expected return, well, your portfolio return? 40 and probability multiply, uh, no, no, oh, sorry, sorry. Portfolio return is weighted average return and weights are 50% each. So 50% stock A, so 50% multiplied by 30% return plus 50% return multiplied by negative 50%. So in other words, these two weighted by half add, you get 25% divided by two, so 50% weight, so 12.5% is the portfolio weight. So if there is an economic boom, your portfolio return will be 12.5%. Similarly, if Next year, we have economic bust. 
your portfolio return will be 50% chance of lose, uh, uh, 50% weight of negative 10% and 50% weight of 25%. So, uh, 7.5%. So, 50% of this plus 50% of uh, 25%. Uh, so that means 15 percent to 25 uh, 50 percent which is 7.5 percent so these are portfolio returns in each state and then how do you calculate expected return variance and standard deviation and then you can forget about stock a and stock b you already have a portfolio return in each state and you can apply this concept to the formulas in previous slides and you can calculate the expected return. How? Expected return of this portfolio is probability 40% multiplied by portfolio return 12.5% plus 60% probability multiplied by 7.5% probability uh, portfolio return in economic bust and all you get the expected return. So this is how to calculate. So um, put for return and standard deviation. So, so that's how to calculate expected return. And then how to calculate standard deviation. So take for your expected return and find the deviation from the um, each stage portfolio return and square multiplied by probability and do the same for economic bust and add all that variance take a square root so that's a uh, standard deviation so here i provide that uh, portfolio return in economic boom and portfolio expected return and um, variance of the portfolio, so portfolio expected return 9.5% and how to calculate variance deviation from the mean for each state and multiply by probability add all that variance and take a square root to standard deviation. So as I emphasized here, Variance and standard deviation is not weighted average because of the diversification concept you will learn soon. So any questions so far? And these question, these calculation problems are very important, but if you don't practice, you may find it very confusing. It's very easy to make mistakes. So you may confuse you with the probability. How oh, should I use probability or should I use weight in this calculation? So until you practice enough, you can easily make mistakes, errors. So you must practice. So yeah, any questions? All right, if you don't have any questions, let's move on. So, so far, up to slide one to slide 13, what you learned is some tools, so analytical tools, calculations, using statistics, so mathematics. And from 14, the slide 14, there comes the finance concept. So you relate those statistical and mathematical calculations to the concept in finance. So this slide just starts explaining expected return versus unexpected returns. So what we calculated in previous slides using probability distribution you calculated expected return. So suppose you construct a portfolio of stock A and stock B now. And actually, let's use this example again. So the portfolio, this is stock A and stock B looks very volatile, very positive return and very negative return, but portfolio return seems to be quite stable. Wow, even though economic, during economic bust, 
7.5% return and during economic boom, 12.5%. So take a closer look at these individual two securities, security A and security B versus portfolio. Portfolio, this portfolio look great. So no matter what happens, this portfolio makes money. So this is great. So how can we construct this kind of great portfolio out of these risky stocks? So that's one of the goals of portfolio managers in the stock market. So you are learning this kind of theory, how to construct a good portfolio using risky stocks. So what's the source of having this low risk but high expected return portfolio compared to the individual securities undesirable characteristics? So because these two stocks, stock A and stock B, it's negatively correlated. One stock doing well, the other stocks going down and vice versa. So in other words, one stock's bad performance is is uh, the risk is mitigated by the other stocks good performance. So the, this is a good portfolio, well diversified, even though it has only two stocks. The portfolio manager picked very curities. So that's why this portfolio, no matter what happens, makes a reasonably good amount of, generates reasonably good returns. So, so this is how, so it's first you should know how to calculate expected return variance and standard deviation to evaluate your portfolios and before investing you need to know understand the expected return and standard deviation and variance of your portfolios you, you need to in other words you need to understand the characteristics of the portfolio before buying stocks to construct your portfolio otherwise you just randomly pick things uh, you may uh, it, that's not a good decision so before making investment decisions you need to understand analyze those securities and understand the securities but the next slide shows expected return is different from realized return so Remember, we are talking about risky investments. By definition, the future is uncertain. So meaning that we analyze securities based on our analysis, all the information we have so far, but in the future, they may be surprises. Because by definition, we are analyzing risky assets that has uncertainty. So that's what this uh, slide ex uh, explains. So expected return versus unexpected return. So realized return on your investment after you make the investment are generally not equal to expected returns because realized return has both expected components and unexpected components. So, at any point in time, the unexpected returns can be either positive or negative. Unexpected return, by definition, is unexpected. We cannot predict. So unexpected return should be on average zero. Otherwise, if unexpected expect, uh, return component does not average out to zero, your expectation process is incorrect. So it, that's what she written here. At any point in time, the unexpected return can be either positive or zero or negative, but over time, the average of the unexpected component should be zero. So for a way over a long period and over well diversified portfolio, we are looking at, we are constructing a well diversified portfolio over a long period of time unexpected component average out to zero. But for if you are just looking at one period, next year, unexpected component can be positive 
or negative for just one time, but all we, we do it over and over again, that unexpected component, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, cancel out. So long-term investors like pension fund managers who manage billions of dollars for many retirees over a long period of time, 20, 30 years, for those kind of institutional investors, large institutional investors managing huge amount of money for many uh, retirees for a long period of time, this component is critical. Expect analyzing its expected return. Because unexpected returns are unpredictable, can be positive or negative, but in the long run, it will average out to zero. And that's why focusing on analyzing expected return and risk trade-off, that's the main focus of this kind of theory. And actually, this is a Nobel Prize winning theory. Nobel Prize of economics, at least the two of them, came out of this story, this theory. So chapter 12 and chapter 13, you are learning that kind of an introduction to that kind of modern portfolio theory. So any questions so far? Right, if you don't have any questions, let's move on. So how do we relate this um, portfolio variance, standard deviation, expected return, unexpected return to the stock market? And this slide shows an example of this kind of application and announcement and news. So we just uh, talked about Realized return has two components, unexpected return and expect, unexpected components and expected components. So that unexpected components. So unexpected returns are based on new information. So it was unexpected because we didn't have enough information about that event. When we calculate expected return for a new investment, we didn't have that information. So we calculated portfolio expected return that way. But after you make an uh, investment in those two stocks, and then the company, company stock A, stock B, we may already made a portfolio, constructed a portfolio, so purchased the stock A and stock B, invested 50% of your money each, in each of those stock A and B, and in, constructed the portfolio P with those A, stock A and stock B. So that's what happened, this, let's say, yesterday. So you, you made an investment. But what if today there was a surprise Stock A, company A announced that it will acquire company C. So that kind of announcement, it was not expected yesterday. Nobody knew about the acquisition plan yesterday, until yesterday. But today, when the stock market opened, the uh, com company A announced that it will acquire company C. So that's possible new information, announcement and news. So announcements and news contain both an expected component and surprise compo components. If a lot of analysts already expected that there may be an acquisition of company C by company A, if that was the case, the, constructor, the portfolio constructed yesterday have some components the expected return component had some kind of a relation. But if that announcement made today was made out of a sudden, nobody, very few people predicted it. If that's the case, most of the uh, announcement information will be a surprise component. So that have a huge impact may have a huge impact. So what you need to understand clearly in this slide is, it's the surprise component of the announcements. So nothing 
so the, not everything in the announcement is a surprise component. It's very important to understand that. So it's the surprise component, not the expected component that affects the stock's price and therefore its return. So it's very obvious uh, when you watch it. Stock price is moved when unexpected announcement is moved or earnings, corporate earnings are different from anticipated. So for example, suppose a company T tomorrow announced earnings and compared to same period the last year, the, the company T's earnings 10% lower compared to the same period last year. So 10% drop in earnings. So if that's the amount the company T will make tomorrow, what's going to happen to the stock price, you think? Those who are not well educated in finance uh, tend to answer that the stock price will drop. But that's not the correct answer. Why not? Because if analysts to, to if analysts are currently estimating that oh company T is struggling a lot during the pandemic, they struggle a lot, and tomorrow they are scheduled, the managers are uh, scheduled the uh, have scheduled the earnings conference call and they will announce earnings for the previous quarter and definitely it will be a lot lower than last year so uh, analysts uh, average estimates of analysts analyzing who are familiar with the company teach business the average estimate is a 15 percent drop if that was the expectation tomorrow it turns out the company T announced that their uh, earnings are 10% lower compared to previous year's earnings, but analysts expected a 15% drop. And then actually that's a good news. Oh, the company was not as bad. The company's business was not as bad as expected. So the stock price may go up. So that kind of example shows when you look at the stock market and when you interpret how to uh, uh, interpret the, the news, new information arriving at the stock market, watch the expected component and watch the surprise and how the stock market respond to those announcements. So that makes a very interesting story. So you need to clearly understand that kind of uh, expected versus return versus realized return expected components versus surprises and expected return and risk trade-off. So any questions so far? So there comes another very important concept, the efficient market hypothesis. So the efficient market hypothesis means Stock prices reflect all available information. And I need to emphasize that this concept, efficient market hypothesis, is a hypothesis. It's not a fact. So I'm not telling you financial markets are efficient. Financial markets, stock markets may be or may not be efficient. Actually, this is uh, like uh, this debate there has been a uh, debate about the efficient market hypothesis for the past 40 50 years and uh, that debate does not end it's a very important but con controversial concept and this is the efficient market hypothesis is related to exactly what we discussed so far so for example The expected component and surprise component of announcement. So how much is the surprise and how much is the expected return? So to determine the surprise component of an announcement, you need to know 
how to find the expected component. So the expected component, how to find it, and how much information is already in the expected component. So if all publicly available information is already reflected on the uh, expected component, if that well, if we, we can see that kind of stock market, that stock market is efficient. So that's the concept of market efficiency. In other words, in an efficient capital market, stock prices reflect all available information. But it's a very challenging task. How come? Stock prices, analysts, expectations about future earnings and that all those information accurately quickly reflected on the stock price so only surprise component not anything else will change the stock price so it's a very challenging task to make all available information i mean by that by all available information for example i mean for example, Tesla stock. So if the stock market, Tesla stock market is efficient, that means how long is Tesla's annual report? At least 100 pages, hundreds of pages of annual reports, phone note to 23 is included there. They, Tesla mentioned something little about uh, their future uh, business and that kind of information, if it's an important one, but hidden in the footnote, that's also accurately reflected in on the stock price. So that's a challenging task. If, if financial markets are efficient, even that kind of information, that's a publicly available information. Anybody can download uh, Tesla's annual report and read it. So if finding if it Tesla stock market is efficient, even that kind of information should be accurately reflected on the current stock price. So the question is, but it's a hypothesis. I'm not telling that that's the case. So if US stock market is always very efficient, reflecting all available information, but it's not necessarily the case. Sometimes small, but sometimes there may be important information that accurately reflected on quickly and accurately reflected on the stock price. So analysts who are smart and hardworking analysts, it's possible to find undervalued stocks. If that's the case, financial markets are not efficient. So what I'm saying, trying to say here is I'm not telling financial markets, U.S. stock markets are efficient or not efficient. I'm asking you to understand this efficient market hypothesis concept and how, why this concept is important, why there have been a lot of debates. And you may have, been, have heard about uh, index funds, S&P 500 index funds. So, S&P 500 index funds versus uh, actively managed funds trying to uh, buy undervalued stocks. So that kind of, would you like to invest in S&P 500 in the index fund? Would you also, or would you like to uh, invest your money in a fund managed by smart and hardworking um, fund manager who tries to find undervalued stocks. So that kind of trade-off, so it's actually a trillion dollar question. You know, are markets efficient? That's a trillion dollar question. And that's behind this kind of debate, after this kind of debate and theory, a trillion dollar, $10 trillion mutual fund industry was born 40, 50 years ago. So this is a very important theory, efficient market hypothesis. And this is a Nobel Prize winning theory. Eugene Fama, a, a finance professor of, uh, at uh, University of Chicago, earned the Nobel Prize of Economics. 
because of this uh, theory, efficient market hypothesis and related uh, contributions. So efficient market, so how, what, to, what makes financial markets become efficient? So this slide shows that efficient markets are a result of investors trading on unexpected proportion of announcements. So suppose there is an announcement and the earnings, a lot of surprises, surprise in a good way, then a lot of investors, traders, oh, this is a good news, new information, stock price should go up, this is stock is more valuable than we, we, we were too pessimistic. So now because of the new information, this is a buy. And then people quickly buy, try to uh, get in, uh, purchase this stock that has better than expected uh, the information. And then that kind of quick response will make stock price go up and adjust to a new fair value. So if that's the case, financial markets are efficient. So competition among well uh, knowledgeable and capable analysts, fund managers, and that kind of competition makes markets efficient. And the, the easier it's traded on surprises, the more efficient uh, financial markets become. So that's why US federal government, SEC, try to uh, uh, make a, a, a fair playing field for every traders to make markets more efficient than everybody benefits from efficient markets. But is really, so how efficient? markets are so that's a, that's a continuous debate and a lot of research has been done and will be done in the future as well so efficient markets so if financial markets are efficient how would the stock prices move stock prices will move randomly in an efficient market capital market because the only, only thing that will change stock prices in an efficient market is the arrival of new information, surprises, and new information surprises, by definition, unpredictable, random, can be good or can be bad. It's always good. It's not on a uh, new information. If it, if it will be always good, that means expectation part has errors. So unexpected components should be either positive and negative, unpredictable. So that's why the arrival of unexpected component is random. So that's why in an efficient capital market, prices change will randomly and we cannot predict surprises. So that's why we cannot predict whether stock price will go up or down in an efficient capital market. But are markets really efficient? That's, uh, there are a lot of debates and disagreements. Yeah. So any questions so far? All right, next slide. So systematic risk the next concept important concept is systematic con risk concept so systematic risk is a risk factor that affects a large number of assets and another name is non-diversifiable risk or market risk so systematic risk non-diversifiable risk and market risk examples are changes in gdp interest rate inflation and are all risk systematic? No, that's not the case. There are also unsystematic risk there. So unsystematic risk that affect a limited number of assets. So it's also another name is unique risk or firm specific risk. So for example, uh, Amazon is a very important company and everybody knows that Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, is a key, pro, pro, a key uh, person for Amazon's future and success. And we know Jeff Bezos is highly respected and he's responsible for a lot of decisions in Amazon. So 
Jeff Bezos, Amazon with Jeff Bezos versus uh, without Jeff Bezos. That's a very big difference. So, but so it, it looks like Jeff Bezos is healthy, and he 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 will be around for many many years. That's the expectation. But in the future, what if Jeff Bezos announced has some kind of health issues? What's gonna happen to Amazon stock price? That will be a huge impact. I'm not saying that Jeff Bezos has a health issue, but what if? Jeff Bezos has a health issue. Amazon stock will have a that will have a huge impact. So that's an example of unsystematic risk. It's not about everybody. It may, may affect Amazon and some other competitors, some some companies, but it's not definitely a CEO's health issue. It's definitely not a systematic risk. It's a, a good example of unique risk, firm-specific risk, unsystematic risk. And another example of uh, unsystematic risk, labor strikes, part shortage, CEO's health, those are firm-specific risk. So how those two types of risk are related? So, the, so, so, so this slide shows how to decompose total returns. So total returns, realize the return on your investment has two components, expected return and unexpected return. And unexpected component of the return has two components, systematic part and unsystematic part. So remember the surprise part, the surprise component of return is important but the surprise component ha has two parts, systematic part that affects everybody and unsystematic part that's firm specific. So in other words, there are three components in the total return realized on your investment. So total return has expected return and systematic portion of unsystematic unsystematic, uh, unexpected return and unsystematic portion of unexpected return. So risk, risk, as we mentioned, as we learned before, risky assets on risk premium. So investors require risk premium for risky assets. So that's why Risky assets have a higher expected return. But should all risk earn risk premium? So that's a big question. So let's take a one minute break. I missed up here. And I will take a screenshot to take attendance. And while waiting, think about it. So should all risk on risk premium? Yes or no? Why? So that's my question. So I take a screenshot of the first page and paste the screenshot in my gradebook and then I go to the next slide and take the next screenshot and paste. Okay, now I took both screenshots and there are 34 students attending. So I write 34 students. Okay, now we can go back. So should all um, risk on risk premium? The answer is no. Why not? Only 
risk that cannot be easily removed. So the risk that can be easily removed. So investors taking risk unnecessarily, those will not, those investors will not be earn risk premium. So investors will earn compensation for taking risk in the form of risk premium only if they take a risk that cannot be easily removed. So only risk that cannot be easily removed, there will be a compensation in the form of risk premium. So which risk, which part of the risk, which, of, which one of the two components of the risk will generate risk premium? One of the most important concepts you learn, should learn in chapter 12 and 13 and 14 is the risk return trade-off. So that's why we uh, work hard to analyze expected returns and measuring risk using various methods. So understanding the risk return trade-off is the core of those chapters. So what kind of risk is compensated by risk premium? The answer is systematic risk. So why unsystematic risk is usually not compensated or less compensated compared to the systematic risk? Because unsystematic risk is firm specific. So if investors construct a well diversified portfolio, negative returns canceled out by positive returns so if those unique risk form specific risk will cancel out in a well diversified portfolio so in a well diversified portfolio only systematic risk market risk that affects everybody that kind of risk remains so nobody can remove market risk completely in a long long position in a stock portfolio so that's why market risk systematic risk will be rewarded by risk premium so that's the concept of diversification so portfolio diversification is the investment in several different asset classes or sectors and many different stocks but diversification is not just holding a lot of assets. If, for example, you, you invest all of your money in healthcare stocks, 30 healthcare stocks, 100 healthcare stocks, that's not a well diversified portfolio. You are concentrating in the healthcare industry. So, healthcare stock, technology stock, retail, banks different sectors and also international stocks, bonds. So diversification across different sectors, different asset classes. So that's the concept of that well diversified portfolio. So if you own 50 pharmaceutical stocks, you're not diversified. If you own 50 internet stocks, you're not well diversified. But if you own 50 stocks that spend 20 different industries, definitely you are well diversified. So in that kind of well diversified portfolio, uh, firm specific risk will be very low. So uh, this uh, table shows when increasing the number of stocks in the portfolio, what happens to the standard deviation. So put, you see the standard deviation going down uh, quickly as we increase the number of stocks in a well-diversified well portfolio, standard deviation goes down because of the diversification benefit from specific risk cancelled out. So the principle of diversification is diversification can substantially reduce the volatility of portfolio return without sacrificing expected returns. So the redux reduction in risk, that kind of benefit arises because worse than expected return from one security 
cancel the buy better than expected return from another asset because unique risk by definition surprises those are surprises unpredictable can you always be lucky that's not possible can you always be unlucky that's not possible some stocks you're lucky other stocks you are not lucky those form specific surprises cancel out in a well diversified portfolio but there is a minimum level of risk you know even in a well diversified portfolio that's the systematic risk because everybody is affected by the market risk the systematic risk that part you cannot avoid so that kind of systematic risk is compensated by risk premium so this is a graphical illustration and we increase the number of securities in a portfolio what happens to the standard deviation it goes down why diversifiable risk from specific risk is going down but what's remaining is non-diversifiable risk market risk unique risk so how to so this standard deviation is a total risk measure but as i emphasized before undiversifiable risk market risk it's important because it's related to the risk of premium so how to measure it so can we measure so this slide shows the diversifiable risk characteristics so diversifiable risk can be removed by diversification and this slide shows total risk has both a systematic risk component and unsystematic risk component. So how to measure? So the systematic risk principle is what I just explained. So there is a reward for bearing risk in the form of risk premium, but there is not a reward for bearing risk unnecessarily. So expected return on risky assets depends only on the, the systematic component of that asset risk because unsystematic risk from specific risk can easily be removed by diversification. That's why unsystematic risk generally does not generate risk premium. So how to measure systematic risk that's related to risk premium we use beta so the beta coefficient of stock a the definition is the covariance of stock a with the overall market market portfolio in the real world good example the most widely used real world example of the overall market portfolio is s p 500 index so, for example, if I ask you to measure the beta of Tesla stock, you need to download the Tesla stock prices and S&P 500 index values, and you calculate P1 minus P0 plus D1 divided by P0, that holding period return formula you apply to the, if I ask you to calcul use, calculate beta using monthly returns and you calculate month one, month two, for example, using five years, 60 monthly holding period return, and you calculate the covariance of Tesla stock and S&P 500 index return, covariance using Excel's covariance function and divided by S&P 500 index return variance, and that's the beta of Tesla stock. So you can easily go to Finance Yahoo and find any stock like Tesla and S&P 500, uh, Yahoo Finance, and a lot of websites provide watch beta for each stock. So for example, these are the betas. Coca-Cola beta, for example, 0.74. Tesla beta 1.19 depends on when you download the data. So it can be different depending on what returns you used. But this is the beta coefficient you can easily download from, find from website. So what's behind that beta coefficient of each star? Systematic risk principle. So we are almost done with this chapter. 
uh, chapter 13 and remember chapter 13 homework to by Monday, I uh, Wednesday, and we are gonna have a quiz uh, on Wednesday on chapter 12 and chapter 13 up to what we learned so far today. So keep working on chapter uh, 13 and then move on to chapter 14. Uh, so if after you finish those homeworks and prepare for the quiz. Okay. So I'm done uh, today. So if you have any questions, you stay. And uh, otherwise, I will see you um, uh, on Wednesday. So let me.